Before 1960, the Himalayan mountain kingdom of Bhutan had no contact with the outside world. Isolationism was a policy of choice. However, squeezed between two regional superpowers, China and India, it was vulnerable to a takeover. So, in 1971, the kingdom joined the UN. That didn't mean that this country, ruled by an enlightened king, educated at Eton, was about to see his country embrace the 20th century pattern of development, one that puts material wealth before all. In the succeeding decades, Bhutan has opened up, but in this edition of Earth Report, we find that it has done so largely on its own terms. In Bhutan, four out of five people still live in villages. To maintain their vitality and culture, the national policy is to discourage urban migration. Rather than being guided by gross national product as a measurement of progress, the government is developing indicators based, it says, on gross national happiness. To reinforce the policy of keeping people on the land, the authorities have banned the sale of plots less than five hectares. The procedures of our administration do not allow for chronic hunger, landlessness or lack of shelter. It's not possible. But there are institutions set up, procedures set up for you to get five acres. But you are holding per family also should not exceed and does not exceed by law beyond 25 acres. I'm not interested in being rich. So far, I'm very satisfied with my life. The Buddhist thinking does not really distinguish individuals from other beings. It puts a lot of stress on interdependence. It makes you see really yourself as a part of a whole range of life across species, across generations. The farmer is also a musician. The farmer is also a painter. He is also a dancer. He is also a textile manufacturer, for example. So in this way, he's, all his potential skills are evoked. It's also a center of training. It's a center of recreation. It's a center of production. A barter system of exchange still fulfills most of the villagers' needs. Most villagers know how to make furniture. Me and a few friends built this house. In the village, we weave our own cloth, not to sell. Those who live in town weave to make a profit. This very way of living in this country, walking, working hard, is also one which builds you up uh, as a characteristic mountain people. You must distinguish between hard work during certain part of, part of the year and the leisure which is produced later on, which is, you know, two, three months you know, for a year. Uh, when you enjoy uh, socialization, cultural life, collective life of a community, for urban life, you're working all through the day. I'd like to stay in the village because I can help my parents. I'm working with village friends, it's fun. When my parents are not here, I can take responsibility for our children's future. I can take responsibility for our children's future. I like the city life, but as a monk I have to stay in the village to look after the people. We are very happy to help the people as far as we can, and when we don't have anything to do in the village, we stay in the monastery. 
Utopia it may seem, but apparently not to the young. They feel the pull of an office job and the city life. Family size in rural Bhutan is shrinking because of the loss of the youth. That means the agricultural labor force in Bhutan is shrinking. That has also led to more land being reverted to forest. So why don't you like the village? No, I don't like the village. <laughs> Where in your dreams would you like to live? This place in <laughs> New York. And when I when I go to town, I want to I want to become become some a great a great person no? for like army officer. But most most probably I I think it's uh, nice in town only because I can see so many people, so many car. Every opportunity is there, every facilities and entertainment like television and everything is there. Comparing to village, there's electricity. Road facility. Yeah, London is his dream place. <laughs> in some villages, we also found out that uh, when we asked them, one of their sons is studying in India, other is working in um, government service, the other one is doing a business. So in the villages, actually, we uh, in some of these houses, they only have a father and a mother. One explanation why the young favour the towns may be what is perceived to be an urban bias in the school curriculum. For a long time, we have had curriculum which were not consistent with the local realities. The kind of things that they have to offer uh, in terms of skills uh, were ma mainly suitable for urban and industrial or official jobs. When I went to school and when I went to college, almost everyone who were working in Bhutan were Indians. Education director was an Indian. The accountant was an Indian. The, ev uh, the typist was an Indian. In all of it, and we are very happy to see that this has been replaced by Bhutanese people. Those who have been educated want to live in town because they understand city life. I wasn't educated, so want to live in the village. I don't want to go to town. I love village life. I miss the village life. I like... So I have left my parents behind and my youngers are behind in the village. But I have to live in town because of my youngest one. I have to educate the youngest one. This is the road. Yeah. Only those from poor families who can't afford modern education send their kids to be monks. Clerk or an officer wouldn't send his child to be a monk because he can afford to give his child a modern education. If you intensify monastic education, urbanization will be far less. For the Students in the schools, I must admit, there is a tendency for them to leave their parental houses. These days, they learn modern education, but not Buddhist. Modern and Buddhist, very different. They forget the religious one. But there's nothing better than experience, and after a while, the migrants to the town hanker after the rural life. My village friends look older than me because they work outside. They think that I have a wonderful life, while I think that the villagers have a wonderful life. I don't understand why some young villagers take drugs and drink alcohol, copying from the town people. 
They like comfort and cleanliness. And I also think that they get ideas from television. They see the advertisements and they copy how to maintain their health and cleanliness. If you go to the city, even if you earn a lot of money, it is so expensive. If you stay in the village, help each other and earn a little extra cash selling agricultural products, that money is bigger than money earned in the city. So it's better to stay in the village and help one another and do productive work. I like to have my government to help you more, to give them more life in the village side, not in town life. But in town, I really feel it's uh, some noisy thing and, and it's cloudy and I don't like the town, town life. In an effort to strike a healthy balance between rural and urban culture, the government is taking steps to stop the drift to the town. And it is very uh, important on the uh, agenda of the royal government to place a lot of emphasis on rural uh, development. And this is how we are going about uh, checking or minimizing the rural uh, urban uh, migration. We try to provide health facilities in the rural areas, good education facilities in the rural areas. We try to reach uh, energy to the rural uh, population. You are a student. So the policy has been to alter the school's curriculum to raise the status of farmers. In the education uh, sector, a lot of uh, farming activities, uh, agriculture subjects are being uh, taught uh, so that the uh, uh, our students do not lose touch with uh, agriculture uh, practices. This has led them to now attempt to revise the curricula. So history, geography, and sort of gradually all the social science subjects are being revised. I don't only teach formal school subjects. I also teach traditional behavior, farming, and also crafts. I try my level best to give extra knowledge to those who don't know these things, and that is government policy. Even if I cannot continue with my studies, there is no harm in staying in the village and farming. While most governments channel their energy to cities and industry, Bhutan's plentiful hydroelectric power is taken to the remotest villages. Electricity is taken up right up to the doorstep. Even though the uh, houses are so scattered, all across the slope of a mountain, you know. The country's largely rural population of three quarters of a million is well served by health centers and hospitals. We have as many as 29 hospitals in this country. And then we have over 500 now, the basic health units, both curative and preventive health services. So there are not many villages where you will have to really walk one hour. <laughs> While much of the rest of the world seems to favour centralising power, Bhutan is experimenting with decentralisation. The guiding principle of decentralisation means that you are taking decision-making power closer and closer and closer to the individual. Government of Bhutan and the National Assembly of Bhutan passed in 2000 a local government act. Theoretically, 200 one bodies can uh, pass all sort of different uh, laws. These days the public have the power to elect their own candidates to government. In my day, the king used to decide. That was good as well. The government is trying to boost the rural economy by making loans and research available to communities to expand food production and small-scale industries. We are encouraging a lot of uh, younger children to return to farms through incentives such as loans, uh, etc. And in the years ahead, we'll have to focus more on this kind of uh, activities where we find, uh, try to make it uh, the rural life as attractive 
as urban life for the younger, the more educated youth. Subject of Tang said, Teru Koragi, Tatanga Tik, Laftuna Levis, Kiawatuna Levis, the Hinsida. We get help from the government about how to plant potatoes, cabbages and other vegetables. To give villagers access to markets, roads to remote villages are being built. Because we now have the road, we can carry loads and do work in town. However, down these roads come cheap imports. The roads have done tremendous things, but with that, of course, as you said, we will also have uh, goods from other places coming to our place. While the government is giving loans to boost rural economies, Farmers complain that they can't compete with cheap imports like butter, rice, noodles, biscuits and sweets from India. We bring our products all the way from the village. But town people can buy their products from nearby shops who source them from India as they are much cheaper. People who stay in the town always look for the cheapest. If we sell ours for less, forget about profit. You don't even break even. There is a lot from India, like different kinds of vegetables, and a big difference in price between Indian and Bhutanese produce. Take a simple product as rice. Uh, there is rice produced within the country as well as rice uh, imported from outside. Now, uh, in terms of market prices, the rice produced in the country is almost twice or if not thrice the cost of uh, rice imported. Time has changed. All the products now come from India, and I was told that they now also come from Japan, Korea, China, and Hong Kong. I'm worried that we are relying on other countries, though I hear that the king is trying to open more industries. We are exporting, uh, you know, uh, orange juices, the tomato juices, pineapple, all kinds of juices, jams, from uh, Bhutan. We need to uh, develop our economy uh, in order to generate revenue for the state exchequer as well as to generate employment, which is increasingly becoming a problem in our uh, country. And for this, to facilitate the growth of the, the service sector, the industrial, the manufacturing sector, a uh, certain amount of foreign investment is required to boost the uh, growth of the local uh, economy. Bhutan is at a crossroads. Does it protect its small businesses? Or, by joining the World Trade Organization, further open its economy to cheap imports and foreign investment? On the one hand, there are risks uh, of joining the organization, but uh, of not joining also, there are probably even greater risks of us being completely marginalized uh, in a very uh, fast uh, liberalizing and globalizing uh, world. Once a member, Bhutan's laws must conform to the organization's rules of liberalized trade and investment or bear sanctions against its fledgling export industries. The ill effects uh, that Bhutan will experience will be similar to, to all the developing countries. Many of the uh, organization meetings in the recent past have not really yielded very good uh, results. There have been protests from different communities, from different individuals. There have been disagreements in the uh, trading arrangements. If it chooses to remain outside the WTO, it will be free to protect its economy from giant foreign multinationals and cheap imports. Foreign direct investment uh, could uh, help uh, Bhutan, provided is a, not a blanket opening of the gate. If the Bhutanese exercise 
very, very selective choice in who can be permitted to come in. Bhutan is facing a dilemma just as great as four decades ago when it opened up to the world. Does it join the World Trade Organization and sign up to free trade or choose to protect its own distinctive culture? There's powerful evidence that Bhutan will continue to follow its own path. A recent step in this direction was a conference to discuss the concept of gross national happiness, where the Crown Prince of Bhutan addressed an international conference of thinkers to debate this issue. Over the three decades that His Majesty has led our nation according to the principles of gross national happiness, we have received an overwhelming amount of encouragement and acknowledgement from our friends, our development partners, and donor agencies. But it is this seminar that starts a process of serious study of the concept and its applicability, not just to Bhutanese development, but to development in all countries. All our development is people-centered, and therefore uh, we do programs that ensure the well-being of the uh, people, and the well-being includes spiritual as well as material uh, contentment. Their own happiness and mental and physical well-being does not really lie in more and more uh, material uh, affluence. If suppose environment is degraded, it must reflect a degradation in your consciousness. And I cannot really see how one could be happy if uh, things all around you are going from bad to worse. Happiness has to be included uh, in anything you do, including development itself. <laughs> <laughs>